Today, I am pleased to welcome Rabbi Suzanne Singer to speak on the topic of how do we find hope in a world with unending problems. Many Colette My members will know Rabbi Singer from her time in Victoria, and I see many of you are here in the crowd today, so I'm very pleased that, about that. Uh, that was more than 20 years ago when she uh, served as a student rabbi at Colette My. She now serves uh, the reform community at Temple Beth El in Riverside, California. As the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, Rabbi Singer is actively involved with making our world a better place. She recently served as a member of the Reform Movement's Commission on Social Action and as president of the Pacific Area of Reform Rabbis. She also served on the City of Riverside's Task Force on Police Reform, as well as as a commissioner for the City of Riverside's Human Relations Commission. She has led advocacy efforts through local interfaith organizations to develop alternatives to incarceration, as well as aid in dying legislation. Rabbi Singer has been named as a Riverside Champion of Justice, as well as Riverside Woman of Distinction. She has published essays and op-eds, in addition to serving both as a director of the Introduction to Judaism program for the Pacific Southwest Council of the Union for Reform Ju Ju Judaism, and as coordinator of a leadership initiative at Hebrew Union College's Los Angeles campus. Rabbi Singer grew up in New York City and holds three master degrees, uh, arts and Hebrew letters, uh, arts and Judaic studies from the Hebrew Un Union College, and a master's in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and many of you may know her from her uh, career uh, as a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, she was ordained by HUC in 2003, and she spent 20 years as a television producer and programming executive, primarily for national public television and in news and public affairs. As executive producer of a national documentary series, uh, she won two national Emmy Awards. So we're so delighted to have uh, Rabbi Suzanne Singer with us today. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And it's absolutely a pleasure to be here with my old friends from Victoria. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. So I think you're all very familiar with the story of the golden calf. And I'm gonna share my screen for a few pictures that uh, perhaps will be illustrative of what I wanna talk about. So this episode occurs when Moses is delayed on Mount Sinai and the people are anxious about his return. And they're convinced that he's never gonna come back. So they talk Aaron, the high priest, into melting all their gold to create an idol that they can worship. And of course, this is considered a terrible sin. However, God was prepared for the people to transgress and offered them a means to repent. The instructions for building the tabernacle, and that is the movable sanctuary that is in the desert. The tabernacle was built as a place for God to dwell and to bring God's presence back among the people by offering the Israelites the opportunity to use their gold for a higher purpose. God is giving them the opportunity to redeem themselves and to resume their intimate relationship to God. But wait, the instructions for building the Mishkan occur before the golden calf. So how do the rabbis come to this conclusion that God is offering the building of the sanctuary as a way to make up for the golden calf? Well, in their clever way, the rabbis assert that the timeline in the Torah is different from real time. That indeed the two portions detailing the work of the Mishkan, though they appear in the Torah before the golden calf, that actually happens after the golden calf episode. Now, why did the rabbis invert the order? Of course, there are myriad interpretations, but I would like to suggest one, which connects to what I would like to focus on in my teaching today. And that is the idea of hope. The idea of possibility. The golden calf represents the flawed nature of humanity. It's almost 100% certain that at some point or another, every human being is going to commit at least one transgression. 
But God is prescient enough to understand this. So underlying God's instructions for the Mishkan is the reality of sin. God kind of knows that people are going to sin. But God wants to guarantee that there's always a possibility of redemption, that there's always a Mishkan, a tabernacle available for every golden calf. And I think it is with this knowledge that we're able to live our lives, with the knowledge that it is never too late, that there's always a way to make amends, that there's always a means to repair our world and ourselves. It is there a priori, if only we are willing to look for it. I think that given the incredibly serious problems that we face in our world, climate change, gun violence, pandemics, economic disruption, even the threat of nuclear war has reared its ugly head again. We need to remind ourselves that we are not driven by fate nor by stars, that to a great extent we have agency and we can engage in tikkun olam, that the tools are there should we choose to utilize them. And by the same token, tikkun hanefesh, repair of the soul, is always there as an option in the face of the many mental, emotional, spiritual challenges that we all face. God is telling us that we can transform our idolatry, our egoism, our greed, our thirst for power into something sacred. It's a little like Dorothy in the story of the Wizard of Oz. She always had the ability to return home, but she just needed to believe it. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. asserted that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, but it doesn't do so on its own. We need to give it a push. And the key ingredient in making that possible is hope. Hope is hard to find these days, yet we need it now more than ever. And believe it or not, hope can spring from the most desperate of places, even from a site like the Twin Towers in New York City, destroyed on September 11th over two decades ago. In fact, two or three days before my first Rosh Hashanah with all of you. Jane Goodall, the world's foremost expert on chimpanzees, recounts. It was 10 years after that terrible day that I was introduced to the survivor tree, a calorie pear tree who had been discovered by a cleanup worker a month after the collapse of the towers. Crushed between two blocks of cement, all that was left was half a trunk that had been charred black with roots that were broken, and there was only one living branch. She was almost sent to the dump, but the young woman who found her, Rebecca Claw, begged that the tree might be given a chance. And so she went to be cared for in a nursery in the Bronx. Bringing the seriously damaged tree back to health was not an easy task, and it was touch and go for a while. But eventually, she made it. And once she was strong enough, she was returned to be planted in what is now the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. In the spring, her branches are bright with blossoms. Last year on the UN International Day of Peace, we gathered around the survivor tree and then I saw it. This is Jane Goodall speaking. I saw the neat perfection of the nest of some small bird. I imagined the parents feeding the nestlings the survivor tree brought back from the dead had not only put out new leaves herself, but nurtured the lives of others. All it took was someone to believe in that little charred trunk, someone to believe in a different outcome than what everyone expected. It took someone with hope. Now, hope is not a Pollyannish attitude towards life believing that problems will magically disappear. It's a choice about tackling the problems. Rabbi Betsy Forrester explains that false hope only masks anxiety. Real hope is a commitment. Psychologist and author David Arnau gives us this definition of hope. Hope enables us to envision the future we desire and supplies us with the energy to build it. Hope is different from optimism. Optimism means believing in happy endings 
while sitting back and waiting for things to get better. Hope requires action. Jane Goodall makes this distinction between optimism and hope. Optimism is a disposition of mind. Hope is a stubborn determination to do all you can to make it work. And hope is something we can cultivate. Hope does not deny all the difficulty and all the danger that exists, but it's also not stopped by them. There is a lot of dark of darkness, but our actions create light. I think we all need to find some light right now in what often appears to be a very dark world. Hovering over all of us is climate change and the existential fear that we may very well destroy the planet. Of course, you all experienced this, I think, last summer, the summer before, temperatures of 116 degrees in British Columbia. Fires so fierce, they actually affect the weather. A two-year drought that might very well last much longer. Now, we've got some rain in the last uh, few weeks here in California, but, you know, that doesn't mean we're, we're out of the woods. At the same time, torrential rains on the east coast of the U.S. and on the west coast have, call, have caused massive flooding. The sea level rising in Florida to the point where the streets of Miami are starting to resemble those of Venice. Yet, there are a number of climate activists who are convinced that we have the tools to save the earth. If only we could muster the hope and the energy. And it's precisely this sense of agency that hope gives us because it, in the end, it is up to us to design our future. And this is exactly what God had in mind when God made a covenant with us, that human beings join with God as co-creators to strive to complete and perfect the world together. If we keep hope as our North Star, we can accomplish amazing things. It gives us the courage to forge ahead despite formidable odds. Take, for example, the Ethiopian Jews who made it to Israel in the 1980s, trudging through the desert for weeks under awful conditions before finally being airlifted to Israel. One of them, Michal Avera Samuels, explains that her community did not know that Solomon's temple had been destroyed. It was destroyed in the year 70. They tried to remain pure in order to deserve entering the temple. Reaching the temple served as their ultimate goal as they made their way out of Ethiopia. She writes, the ideal of Jerusalem was the force that provided us with the stamina to persevere during the arduous trek through the desert. It was the dream that kept us going. We wanted to reach it, achieve it. We buried our beloved family members, left possessions behind willingly and lost them to vicious thieves. We struggled to keep going despite the terrible conditions and the hunger, only because of our goal to reach Jerusalem of gold and after so many generations stand at the gates of the Holy Temple. When we face adversity, it's hope that gives us the confidence to rally our indomitable spirit to overcome it. Resilience is linked to the belief that we can make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. Hope really gives us the will to not only heal ourselves, but to make the world a better place. Indeed, according to essayist Gabriel Marcel, it's only when we are tempted to despair that hope can exist. It is a willed response to despair. The word despair actually comes from the Latin and it actually means without hope. Hope is an investment in making another outcome possible. <laughs> and it takes perseverance and strategy because we usually cannot make the changes we envision on the first or even the second try. You might find this surprising, but hope is actually a very Jewish value. The rabbis of our tradition tell us that when we arrive in heaven, God will ask us seven questions, the most important of which is, did you live with hope? The late chief rabbi of Great Britain, Jonathan Sachs, explains Western civilization is the product of two cultures, ancient Greece and ancient Israel. 
The Greeks believed in fate. The future is determined by the past. Jews believed in freedom. There is no evil decree that cannot be averted. The Greeks gave the world the concept of tragedy. Jews gave it the idea of hope. Think about our central story, the Exodus. The Israelite slaves were in bondage for hundreds of years. If the story were told in ancient Greece, that would be their fate forever. But in the Hebrew Bible, one of those slaves, Moses, had a different view and a different vision of the future. Israelites would be freed. They'd be freed from their bondage and be in a land of their very own. The Exodus story tells us that our circumstances do not define us and that we can change those circumstances for a better future. The Talmud amplifies this message because even before the Israelites leave Egypt, when they are at their very worst under the yoke of Pharaoh, Moses' sister Miriam does not allow them to give up. Upon hearing of Pharaoh's decree to drown newborn Israelite males, Amram, father of Miriam and future father of, father-in-law of Moses, the greatest man of his generation said, we are 19 laboring in vain. He reasoned, why have children, why have children? Pharaoh will kill them. So he divorced his wife, Yohebed, and the rest of the Israelite husbands followed suit. Miriam confronts her father saying, Pharaoh decreed against the males, but you decree against the males and the females. In the case of the wicked Pharaoh, perhaps his decree will be fulfilled, but perhaps not. Whereas in your case, because you are so pious, your decree will certainly be followed. Whereupon Amran remarried Yohebed and the rest of the men took their women back. The Talmud continues the tale. As a child, Miriam prophesied that her mother would give birth to a son who would redeem Israel. When he was born, light filled the room. Amram kissed Miriam on the head saying, your prophecy is being fulfilled. When they threw him into the river in the basket, he slapped her on the head and said, where is your prophecy? And thus it is written, and his sister stood from afar in order to know what would be done to him, to know what would become of her prophecy. In other words, because Miriam had hope and belief in a future that was different, she insisted that her parents have another child. And that is the ultimate sense of having hope is to have a child and to bring someone into the future. And Rabbi Sachs suggests that the whole Tanakh, in fact, the whole Hebrew Bible is a story about hope. That might sound surprising. Even God's name is itself a future tense. God tells Moses at the burning bush that God's name is Ehiye Asher Ehiye. I will be what I will be. The future is yet to unfold and contains infinite possibilities. We are made in God's image, so we can also change and evolve. If we look at how the Tanakh is structured, we can see how the future is always present. Indeed, there's no ending or closure to any of our stories. There was always more to come. We're not in a static place. Think about it. The Jewish story begins with Abraham being called to leave his land for another place. But there's no settling down in that promised land. There are exiles and returns. And the whole Tanakh ends with the people in exile longing to come back. The promise is over the horizon. Rabbi Sachs also points out the same is true of Jewish belief. Judaism is the only civilization whose golden age is in the future the messianic age, the age of peace, when nation will not lift up sword against nation and the Lord shall be one and his name shall be one. What underlies his future in the present is the belief in human freedom. We can choose our destiny. The future is open. If we don't like what we see in our society or in our world, 
we have the capacity to make things better. Contrast this with the worldview of the other ancient civilizations. Again, as Rabbi Sachs explains, the ancients believed that human destiny lay in the stars or blind fate. Spinoza argued that our lives are governed by natural necessity. Marx claimed that history was determined by economic interests. Freud held that human behavior was shaped by unconscious drives. Neo-Darwinians argue that we are governed by genetic codes hardwired into our brains. Freedom in all these theories is an illusion. Our God, on the other hand, is outside of nature, able to create by the word, and offering human beings the gift of language, which allows us over any other living beings, the ability to use the future tense. Rabbi Sachs concludes, to be a Jew is to be an agent of hope in a world serially threatened by despair. Every ritual, every mitzvah, every syllable of the Jewish story is a protest against escapism, resignation, or the blind acceptance of fate. Judaism is a sustained struggle against the world that is in the name of the world that could be, should be, but is not yet. Well, you might say, that's a lovely thought, but we are living in a polarized world. There is no way to change the minds and actions of those on the opposite side of the political spectrum. Well, I wouldn't agree completely as radical shifts are possible and have occurred. Take the story of Derek Black, for example. So this is Derek Black, who was referred by, to by his father as the devil child. And this was meant as a compliment. Derek's father, Don Black, was the creator of Stormfront, the internet's first and largest white nationalist site. His mother, Chloe, had been married to David Duke, hmm. one of the US's most infamous, infamous racial zealots in the word of the Washington Post, which featured the story about Derek. David Duke was also Derek's godfather. Derek was raised in the world of white nationalism and at 19, he was already a prominent spokesperson for the cause. He hosted his own radio show, launched a white nationalist website for children and was considered one of the leading lights of the movement. Eight years later, Derek was trying to untangle himself from the movement. What happened to cause this turnaround? Well, after high school, Derek decided to study medieval history. So he applied and was accepted to a liberal arts school with a strong program in that subject. The school also ranked as one of the most pot friendly and most gay friendly in the state, what? according to Derek's dad, Don. But Don wasn't worried. He was sure the school would be influenced by Derek, not the other way around. At first, Derek refrained from discussing his views on campus. He hung out with students in his dorm, including a Peruvian immigrant and an Orthodox Jew. Then he was outed by a fellow student who had been researching terrorist groups. A heated online discussion ensued. How do we as a community respond, read one post. Some of his friends emailed Derek that they felt betrayed. Others flipped him off from a safe distance on campus. Derek soon moved out of student housing. Then, according to the Post, one student wrote, ostracizing Derek won't accomplish anything. We have a chance to be real activists and actually affect one of the leaders of white supremacy in America. Who's clever enough to think of something we can do to change this guy's mind? So what do you think these students did? I'm letting you think about that for a minute. Because before answering, I'd like to explore the issue of extremism and intolerance that this story raises. Derek's story illustrates the difficulty we have today in talking to one another. We demonize the other side because we're so often at absolute opposite ends of the political spectrum. The left is outraged over administration policies. The right is outraged over the left's political correctness. Finding a middle ground seems virtually impossible. 
We sometimes ask ourselves whether we should even engage the other side if we disagree so profoundly. So what is the appropriate way to respond? And what are the consequences of not engaging? Well, hope is a really a decision to fight against the odds, no matter how forbidding. Now, what the people did in Derek's dorm was to invite him to dinner. They invited him to dinner to a Shabbat dinner on Friday night run by the Orthodox student, Peruvian immigrant, all sorts of other people were there also. And they didn't confront him directly about his politics. They just got to know him. And once he got to know an immigrant and a Jew, he realized that his opinions were completely off base. And he made a complete, complete turnaround and has spoken against white supremacy and his past and all of that. It's pretty incredible. And there are other stories, many other stories that I've heard like this of people who completely turn around. So as I said, hope is a decision to fight against the odds. Yeah, the odds are bad. The chances of turning a Derek around are quite slim, but that doesn't mean that there's no possibility of it happening. If you think about the Jewish people over the many centuries, how have we survived with so many other ethnic groups disappearing? Hmm. We should have been destroyed so many times. Yet here we are returning to Israel as a sovereign nation. That seemed impossible, didn't it? And yet we have our wonderful Israel, despite the fact that that seemed completely impossible. So, should she say something about Israel? Um, we preserve this hope, despite everything, despite all the attacks against it, even though it seemed like a complete pipe dream. So there's Theodore Herzl, who famously said, if you will it, it is not a dream. That's really, I mean, unfortunately, he did not leave, live to see his dream come into being, but he set the stage for it. And even Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel speaks of the centrality of hope. He said one must wager on the future. I believe it is possible in spite of everything to believe in friendship in a world without friendship, and even to believe in God in a world where there has been an eclipse of God's face. We must not give in to cynicism. To save the life of a single child, no effort is too much. To make a tired old man smile is to perform an essential task. To defeat injustice and misfortune, if only for an instant, for a single victim, is to invent a new reason for hope. Again, this is not to deny that there's much to be concerned about in this world. Aside from climate change, there's an awful war going on in Ukraine. The coronavirus epidemic and pandemic which wreaks so much havoc is really not over. Inflation is out of control. With concerns particularly about the rising costs of fuel and food and housing, the pressing need for healthcare reform here and in Canada, global supply chain problems and democracies are at risk in so many places. Yet, interestingly, according to a recent New York Times article, on many metrics, the world is generally doing a lot better. That might be surprising. War is rarer today by some measures than it has been for most of the past 50 years. Genocides and mass atrocities are a lot less common. Life expectancy, literacy, and standards of living have all risen to historic highs. Also steadily declining in recent decades, hunger, child mortality, and extreme poverty. So why does it often feel like despite all the data, things are only getting worse? Well, there are a few reasons for this. The ways in which the world is most significantly improving tend to be gradual, unfolding over generations. And many of the changes are about prevention. No one notices the wars that don't happen the family members who aren't claimed by disease, the children who don't die in infancy. 
thanks to the internet with news consumption far greater than it once was, even those who live far from crises now live in a digital world of constant dire updates. If your social media feeds and home screens serve up a steady stream of calamities, they can feed an overwhelming, sometimes misplaced sense of threat, as if the world itself were caving in. Still, the feeling that the world is getting worse is not universal. In fact, it is mostly held by residents of rich countries like the United States and Canada. Survey after survey has found that a majority of people in low income and middle income countries such as Kenya or Indonesia, tend to express optimism about the future for both themselves and their societies. So maybe we should stop and see the bigger picture. Maybe we need to take the long view. In the end, hope is a strategy, not a feeling. And it's within our power to call it forth. And how do we do that? We have some authors who have given us some ideas. So author Doug Abrams, who wrote this book about hope with Jane Goodall, tells us that hope science has identified four components that are essential for any lasting hope in our lives. We need to have realistic goals to pursue, as well as realistic pathways to achieve them. In addition, we need the confidence that we can achieve these goals and the support to help us overcome adversity along the way. We must choose to have hope. In the words of historian Howard Zinn, human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. Well, you might say changing the world takes a lot of time. I don't have an unlimited number of years to see the change I want. So we need to keep our eye on the prize, even if the prize is far into the future. The example of Honey the Circle Maker is instructive. Pony, whose story appears in the Talmud, is a kind of Rip Van Winkle who sleeps for 70 years. Here's the story. One day, Honey was journeying on the road and he saw a man planting a carob tree. He asked, how long does it take for this tree to bear fruit? The man replied, 70 years. Honey then further asked him, are you certain that you will live another 70 years? The man replied, I found already grown carob trees in the world. As my forefathers planted those for me, so I too plant these for my children. Pony sat down to have a meal and sleep overcame him. As he slept, a rocky formation enclosed upon him, which hid him from sight, and he slept for 70 years. When he awoke, he saw a man gathering the fruit of the carob tree, and Honey asked him, are you the man who planted the tree? The man replied, I am his grandson. Thereupon, Honey exclaimed, it is clear that I have slept for 70 years. The lesson to take from this story is that one needs to believe in and build a future, even if we ourselves may not be there to experience it. And even if we are not recognized for what we do. We must plant seeds for our grandchildren so that they might experience a better world. After all, that is our obligation as Jews. Now, one of the obstacles to hope is not just despair, it's also a fear of change, a resistance to things being different from what we always have known. 
You may have noticed that in all the stories of the Tanakh that I mentioned, the future is always about change. The fact is we can never go back even after this pandemic. Oh, let's go back to the way things were. were nope, we're not going back. Zoom is here to stay, for example. But change is almost always uncomfortable. So we resist the idea that change is inevitable and constant. When will we ever get back to normal, we ask? Well, again, to quote Rabbi Ed Feinstein of Valley Beth Shalom, we are never going back to normal. This is the new normal. So it's time we reimagine normal, but how do we begin? Luckily, our tradition is very rich with imagination. We've managed to continually reinvent ourselves over the course of our history. As Rabbi Feinstein points out, each catastrophe has led Jews to redefine who we are. Each crisis has sparked a radical new way of being Jewish and of surviving. The ninth of Av commemorates the destruction of the temple by the Romans in the year 70. This was an incredibly devastating moment for Jews and for our sages. They believed that the very center of the world was a rock on which the temple was built. Not to mention that the temple was considered to be God's dwelling place. Up to this point, our religion and our identity were based on three fundamental elements, the land of Israel, a descendant of King David on the throne, and the sacrificial temple cult. Once the temple was gone, we were in exile from the land and the Davidic dynasty was no longer in power. How could we continue? Well, the rabbis came up with three new pillars to sustain Judaism. The world stands on three things. Perhaps you sing this sometimes when you do a hakafa, al shlosha devarim ha'olam omed, al ha'torah ve'al ha'avodah ve'al gemilut chasadim. The world stands on three things, on Torah, worship, and loving deeds. These elements of our new identity could be practiced anywhere, anytime, and by anybody. In other words, the rabbis created a portable Judaism. And unlike many people of the ancient Near East, thanks to the rabbi's imagination, we're still here. That's why Rabbi Feinstein says we should celebrate the night, the 10th of Av, the day after the temple's destruction, because we did not allow that, that catastrophe to annihilate us. Two other very important inflection points that Rabbi Feinstein points out. The first one, the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492 was of course incredibly traumatic as well. Our sage's response was to develop a mystical understanding of this tragedy. The Zohar, composed and written during the Spanish Reconquista, is a central document of Kabbalah, the mystical tradition of Judaism. The Zohar imagines that the exile of the Jews is a metaphor for the exile of God's presence from the world. God's presence is called the Shekhinah. And here's how one Kabbalist describes the Shekhinah's exile. At the beginning of creation, the Shekhinah dwelled on earth and the flow of blessings came down from heaven. Then came Adam and sinned, ruining the system, blocking the channels, causing the blessings to cease. So the Shekhinah fled. Thus, the world's order unraveled and Shekhinah roamed like an itinerant from place to place. For the Kabbalists, it is the responsibility of Jews to save the world from this exile by performing mitzvot, commandments. Performing a mitzvah releases sparks of the divine. The Sfat Emet, another Kabbalist, puts it this way. It's really within human power to renew each thing. However, darkness covers the earth. It is within the power of man to light up that point within the darkness. You do this by means of mitzvot. The other radical moment of transformation for Jews was the failure of emancipation. Though Jews in countries like Germany and France became full citizens in the 19th century, anti-Semitism did not go away. In fact, it became more virulent. Confronting this reality in 1896, 
Theodor Herzl publishes Judenstadt, the Jewish state, advocating for a Jewish home. Zionism was thus a response to the notorious Judenfrog question of the Jews, or really the, quote, problem of the Jews. It would only happen after Herzl's lifetime, but in 1948, the state of Israel became a reality. Again, quoting Herzl, Im tirtsu ein zo agada, lihiot am chofshi ba'artsenu ba'eret sion ve'yushalayim. If you will it, it is not a dream to be a free people in our land of Zion. Our capacity for innovation and imagination is also clear in the incredible work Israel has accomplished in the area of high tech, which is why the country is known as a startup nation. It seems to me that we are now at such an inflection point, both in our history and in the world and within Judaism. How do we know when we're at such a point? When the old ways don't work anymore. Remember that old saw that is falsely attributed to Albert Einstein. Definition of insanity is repeating the same mistakes and expecting different results. To bring it even closer to home, how do we reimagine Judaism in the 21st century? Because it's clear, not just synagogues, but churches too are shrinking, merging, folding. The model that has served us for many decades is no longer viable the way it once was. The younger generations don't seem to want what we have to offer. We can no longer assume if we build it, they will come. As URJ president Rick Jacobs asserted a few years ago, synagogues no longer automatically come with Jews. And I don't think we can close our eyes to this reality much longer. One question that we must ask is, are denominations with their bureaucracies still needed? Eek, that's a big question to ask. Or is there some way to think about bringing the conservative and reform movements together? Or maybe we're post-denominational. Another question that's even more key. What is the purpose of the synagogue? How do we best serve those who are members and those who wish to become members? Are there ways in which we can partner with other synagogues and other Jewish institutions? We learned during COVID that technology can go a long way towards reaching a wider audience. So how much do we need to hang on to real estate? Author Simon Sinek, who wrote Start With Why, says that successful organizations are those that are very clear about their purpose. They don't sell what they have to offer but why they are in business. For example, Apple is so successful because they market their vision, not their products. Quote, we're here to challenge the status quo might be their motto, not we make beautifully designed computers and phones. Another example, TiVo allowed you to pause what you were watching on TV and allowed you to skip commercials. Great idea, right? Well, TiVo failed miserably. What if they had offered people this idea? Are you someone who likes to be in control? That might have made them wildly successful. As Simonek says, people don't buy what you do, but why you do it. You need to be really clear about our mission. Why should people value Judaism? Maybe because it gives them hope. Why should they join a synagogue? Does our mission speak to the younger generation? Should we start thinking out of the box? Let us be inspired by the words of Kathy Cohen who wrote Prayer for Change. The sky is so wide without boundary. We try, but gaze through a narrow lens, bird's eye, human eye, view from the window of a plane. God without boundary, please widen our gaze. When faced with change night into day or day into night, please let us meet transition without fear. Let moments of change lift us into possibility. Please wrap us in your limitless presence. <clears throat> now, last month I was filled with hope as my confirmation class participated in the Lataken weekend 
which is run by the Religious Action Center of Judaism. And there are my happy confirmation students. <clears throat> this is a wonderful opportunity for Jewish teens to learn about the legislative process and to get the chance to lobby their representatives. And they get to lobby on a variety of issues from mental health to climate change. This is uh, a Havdalah service at the Jefferson Memorial. My kids are in the front. <clears throat> Over 400 teens gathered in Washington, DC for an intense four days where they learned to grapple with how to make our world a better place. Seeing these young people in action made me feel that our future is in good hands. So let's you and I preserve hope so that we might leave the world in better shape than we found it, at least for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm feeling a little bit teary. Uh, so um, I want to thank you for um, offering such a moving vision and uh, such a, a thorough overview of um, uh, our history and our values and uh, and how we can uh, encourage this in our in our daily lives. Um, Sam, if you could stop the recording now and we'll go into the Q and a.